And so I want to open it up for questions. If there's any burning questions, I have a few, but I want to first just open it up and see if anybody has questions. So Mark, talk to me about, as you're kind of sitting down to think about, you know, starting a search, um, PubMed versus Google Scholar and, and how you, you I, my sense is you use both, but how you determine and, and sort of that order effect of, of the two. Yeah, I think first, uh, it's bizarre watching myself give a presentation. I, I've done it many times. I totally empathize. It's, it's, not, it's not fun. I, it, empathy for sure. <laughs> No, I, uh, I appreciate the, the opportunity to be here. Uh, so, uh, yes, to answer the question, Google Scholar versus PubMed, essentially now, how you would choose to, to uh, which one to decide which one to, to search, essentially. Uh, I would think for most clinical questions um, across the board uh, or health sciences research-related questions, PubMed would be the default uh, database to search. It has the, uh, the important clinical journals, uh, most of the important clinical journals and, and research-related journals. So that would be your best, like, yield. Ultimately, uh, with that said, Google PubMed doesn't have everything, uh, so it does have some limitations. And Google Scholar can supplement a PubMed search pretty well. Um, it's more interdisciplinary, uh, like not just across the health sciences, but across all fields essentially. So if you have a question that you know borders um, business in health sciences, or engineering in health sciences, or uh, psychology in health sciences, uh, you might get some unique content. You probably would get unique content in, in Google Scholar. Um, the uh, it also it, the one downside I guess one catch is a couple catches one is that you might get a lot of results in Google Scholar it's pretty massive so you might get a, more results than uh, you would in PubMed and PubMed results alone can be difficult to, to manage um, uh, and there aren't the, uh, the all that mesh and syntax stuff most of that syntax and mesh stuff that I was talking about isn't present in PubMed so it could be or in uh, Google Scholar so it can be difficult to to refine your searches in such a way that you see like the cream of the crop uh, at the top of the result sets. Um, uh, yeah, I guess uh, that would be the summary. Great. Other questions? Hi. Oh, sorry, I have a question. Hi, I'm Daria. Um, I have a quick question. I'm actually working on a project at the moment that is a literature review and hopefully a meta-analysis. And um, we came across a few articles that are foreign language articles that we couldn't find uh, a translation for. And I was just wondering how you would suggest um, we go about working with those articles or excluding them. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it might be uh, somewhat contextual to the team. So if you, are, if you have a network of people who can speak various languages and, and would be willing to translate the article for you freely, uh, that would be option one. Uh, at the University of Michigan, there are some trans like uh, there are translation services, so there might be one at, at your institution too. But that would cost money. I have read papers that have used um, uh, like uh, some trans like online search like a translation. I don't know Google Translate or whatever it is, and, and I can't say that that's effective. Uh, but people have used it in publications, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, but uh, beyond that, like if you're unable due to resources or language expertise or availability of people with that expertise. Um, it's not uncommon to exclude those papers from your analysis, uh, your review, and then just make like a note in the um, discussion about the limitations. Like, uh, you know, we had to exclude X number of studies because they weren't published in this language or we weren't able to access them because of language limitations. And that could then, you know, be a limitation to the study ultimately. Um, Harry, can I ask, I'm going to ask a follow-up question before, before I come to you, okay, just on that topic. So, you know, Daria is working on a systematic review, and, and one question I think I have is just, how does she know when she's done, right? Like, in other words, um, how many databases to search? How do you, how, how, like, at what point do you say, uncle, and like, you, you've done your, you've done your job with respect to, so Daria can walk into her, what year are you at, Daria? Uh, second year. Right, so she can walk into room three year feeling confident that she has done a robust literature research. If only there was a good answer. Okay. To the question. Now, the uh, so part of it's uh, what we in my field we call saturation. You you, you reach a point of saturation. There's uh, and and that is defined essentially um, like subjectively. Like you start seeing the same citations again and again. Um, 
In addition to that, though, uh, and when I say you start seeing the citations again and again, I mean you see the same citations coming up in multiple databases, and you see uh, the citations, um, uh, same cite Gets citations. Back. He's, whenever I'm talking to my computer, he doesn't, uh, he's a part of my computer, I think, at this point. Uh, you'll see the same citations cited over and over again. Um, so those are like two measures of saturation. Uh, but beyond that, I think more fundamentally, if you have a search kind of in the structure and logic that I outlined in that presentation, that would give you a sense that you have at least uh, um, designed an effective search and then may inform kind of your, your perception of whether you're, you've reached that level of saturation or not. But unfortunately, it's largely topic dependent. The number of results you see and whether you're comfortable and uh, confident in saying that you've kind of searched everything. It depends on the topic. Some topics will only have 100 citations, some will have 5,000. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's largely topic dependent. And then the other piece of this I would uh, address is the number of databases to search. is also somewhat topic dependent um, in that, uh, so uh, I'll take a step back. Prisma is like this uh, underlying reporting standard for systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And Prisma and then the Cochrane collaboration recommend that you at least search two databases, uh, Medline database, so either PubMed or Ovid Medline and um, Embase, which is a, a database like PubMed, uh, but has more international literature. So those two tend to be the most commonly searched databases for health sciences related clinical or uh, systematic reviews. Uh, but then if you have a, um, a kind of a niche piece of the or subject dependent uh, aspect of your topic, you might need to go into like a, a nursing and allied health database or a psychology related database or education database. Uh, so that part of it, it would be dependent on your, on your topic. Dr. And I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna, I put it in the chat, but I'm gonna add that for the foreign language papers, one of the strategies I've used is, I look at the figures in the paper, which, Math is sort of a universal language, even though you can't read what the figure says. And depending on the language, you might be able to get a sense of what the figure says. To get a sense of like, how important is this? Do the, does it, do the data look convincing? Is it really useful as one way to kind of decide if you want to spend the effort getting it translated? I once got a paper translated, I think from Chinese. Um, and the lesson I learned from that was it wasn't a very good, like, I was kind of sorry I spent the resources to do that, although it was it was useful to read it. But so try and get a sense of how good a paper it is, like how much. And Mark, tell me if that makes sense from a librarian's perspective. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's challenging. It's it's, it's a, a challenge for these comprehensive search projects to get access to all the literature. First, you need access to the databases to know that you this paper exists, this possible research exists, and then you have to be able to interpret it, and that largely depends on um, means outside of your control in part. Uh, but yeah, what you described is if it works, it, it, you know, maybe the next time it, it would yield better results than, than the time you, you went through that path. So now can I ask my question, Chad? And actually, if, if yes, there's you a may. student who has a question, I yield the floor. Okay. Um, uh, so I, I, um, I'm acutely aware of what we call the cereals crisis, the sort of expanding increased cost of subscriptions to journals for libraries. I actually co-chaired my university's library futures task force last year. Um, so I got a really inside look at how depressing this whole thing is. Um, so my question for you is, let's say you're a medical student and you've got your list of papers you wanna read. And it turns out there's six of those papers that your university does not have a subscription to. Do you have any uh, legal approaches to um, getting those articles without paying $40 a piece? Uh, standard, not lawyer uh, uh, caveat right here. But uh, your library at the institution will have an interlibrary loan um, or a document delivery service. So if you are encountering a paywall of some degree as you're trying to access articles, I would encourage you to just reach out to your, to your library uh, and they can set you up with uh, the articles probably. Um, because if your institution does not have access to the print version of the article, if there is one, or the online version of the article, they will likely be able to reach out to other institutions uh, that would have access. 
to those articles and it would be, there would be no cost to you, the student. The cost is absorbed by the, the library budget typically. And I have a question. How many of you on this call as students have used interlibrary loan? How many of you know how to use interlibrary loan at your institution? Okay, I see some hands there. It's really useful. So um, thank you for raising that. Um, and I have found it sometimes takes a day, but rarely do you need it that quickly. Um, I will also say theoretically, most journals have a rule that if you are taking care of a patient and need access to an article for a patient care reason, the journal will give you free access to the article. I am not entirely clear how well that works. I don't know, Mark, if you know the answer to that. And obviously, if you're doing a research project, you can't say I have a clinically critical need to get access to this article. Yeah, I've heard of the rush services and um, things of that like, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't run one of those myself and it might be journal dependent or institution dependent, I'm not sure. And it might come at a cost if it's uh, like an expedited request, but I'm not sure. Other questions? I'm just going to monitor the chat. I don't know. It's like, okay, great. Yes, other questions? Yeah, I have to, be, oh, good. Daria, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I have actually another question. Um, so another thing we ran into was how to deal with gray literature and it, whether to include gray literature or not in our literature review. Yeah, good question. Uh, gray literature is, um, for those who might not be aware of it, is uh, like non-traditional data, essentially publications, things that aren't published in peer-reviewed journals. So it's like conference abstracts, it's government reports, uh, uh, it could be any sort of anything that's not really in a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, so that, uh, again, is somewhat, the answer to that question is somewhat dependent. The gold standard answer, uh, a gold standard systematic review or similar project would be to search that literature and include it. Um, that's like the default you should operate under, but uh, it can be challenging to find this information um, and uh, it can be um, difficult really to get meaningful data from that type of information too. Because uh, it's one thing to identify that an abstract was presented at a conference that seems relevant to your topic and in the supplemental issue of the journal where that abstract is presented is, you know, it's like a paragraph and you only have so much data there. Uh, so you then have to reach out to the authors potentially to the authors of that presentation to see if they have more data they're willing to share uh, so that you can incorporate data that would be, you know, kind of in line with the peer review data you're looking at and other sources. Uh, so there's a lot of challenges ultimately to accessing the great literature, uh, but uh, I guess to the broad stroke answer to your question would be work under the assumption that you should include it because it will minimize publication bias, especially, uh, and might also um, provide some meaningful information depending on your topic. Uh, but uh, you could, uh, if you run into issues, you might have to exclude it or not search it. And then that's another limitation you would add to your, you, you did not, we only considered like the peer reviewed literature. We didn't look at um, uh, any great literature, non-traditional sources of information that could have shed some light on our topic one way or another. Thank you. And I just have a quick follow-up. So you mentioned um, preventing publication bias. Is there, are there any other things that we can do while doing a literature search to prevent publication bias or decrease publication bias? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Like the um, the primary way to reduce publication bias will be to search the great literature and then run some statistical test to identify. I think it's just, I don't know how to calculate the publication. It'd be some graph, you know, that has a distribution of uh, dots essentially. Uh, uh, that's my ignorance since I can barely understand. Uh, but you, by searching multiple databases, uh, you are reducing bias because you're not just looking at one set of core collection of journals. You're, you have a world view, essentially, by searching multiple databases, uh, by keeping your search terms broad, as broad as you can, and looking at a reasonable number of results. You're reducing um, certain types of bias. You could also uh, take a look at like reference lists. And so you would ultimately whittle down your, in a systematic review, you would start with X number of papers and whittle them down to like 10 or so, whatever number it is that you're including in your analysis. Uh, or summary of thematic analysis or, or quantitative analysis. And um, of those 10 papers that you've included, you could take a look at the references in those papers. And then you could also see who has cited that those particular papers. Not all of these methods are addressing publication bias per se, but they are addressing certain types of biases that the systematic review methodology is 
in place to help, uh, to help address essentially. Uh, and these would be the means through which you could, uh, or these, the search method, the broad search method would help address a lot of those uh, types of concerns. A funnel plot, that's the thing. <laughs> So, Mark, I uh, I struggle with PubMed because, frankly, mesh headings is a lot like thinking in Fortran, and I just I just have a tough time. Uh, I lean pretty heavily on on citation maps and finding a key article and then building backwards. Is there any role for that in this process, as you see it? Yeah, for sure. That's a that's a good observation, a good approach. Uh, I'll start by saying, as far as mesh goes, like 99% of the searches, if you are just doing any sort of search that isn't tied to like a, you know, systematic review or something, then you could get by without having to deal with, with mesh. But once you start uh, bordering onto research projects and topics that require, uh, or projects that are built upon a comprehensive liter literature search, peer reviewers and editors are going to want to see the mesh terms in your searches. Uh, so that alone is a motivation to use them. Uh, but as for the process you described, yeah, uh, Anytime I'm involved in these types of searches, uh, that's essentially how I start. I start with articles that I know to be relevant, uh, take a look at the terms assigned to those articles, um, and then use those terms that have been assigned to that article to start fleshing out um, uh, a search. And some ways to find ideal articles include uh, just knowledge of the topic, but then also the saturation point kind of discussion we had earlier where you see these kind of canonical papers referenced again and again. Uh, so you can take one or two or three papers that you know to be relatively relevant to your topic and then build a search around them based on them, essentially. I think we have time Daria, for a couple more questions. Yeah, go ahead. I have a question for Daria. Are you working with a librarian in your systematic review? Uh, that's great. Yeah, we are. That's great. Just, and I just, I just, just want to say, um, you know, I know our library, and I think most health sciences libraries, we have a concierge service where you can just call them and say, help me, I need to do a search. And they are fabulous at teaching you how to do searches. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a shout out to our library colleagues, including Mark, who are amazing. And if you're having trouble finding an article, they are wizards and you should consult them. And I guess... Uh, Neil, thank you for sharing your own frustration with mesh. I agree with you. I tend to use your, your approach. I'm curious if any of our medical students, tell, tell me what struggles you've had with searching the literature. Like, what are the things that, you know, make life harder when you're trying to find an article? Hi, um, my name's Kay. Um, I think when I, I've never done like an actual formal literature review, um, but when looking for articles or anything like that, I think sometimes um, knowing exactly what to search and sometimes titles are misleading or not mis intentionally misleading, but you wouldn't think, oh, it's going to relate to this topic, you know, specifically. So sometimes when I'm trying to search things, I'm, you know, I don't know. It's hard to tell what a title, what article is going to be worthwhile based on the title sometimes. And you don't have always enough time to look through every single one. So prioritizing what I should be investigating in, you know, sometimes too, because I'll like get into one and then I'll be deep in it. And then I'm like, oh, I just spent a lot of time and it's not totally relevant, but it's an interesting article, you know, so usually. <laughs> Yeah, I do. I do the same thing where I kind of go down a rabbit hole and then end up being far enough away from the, the beginning of my, my actual literature search that I need to rewind and kind of regroup <laughs> before I continue. Um, I also do manually just kind of look through the citations of a paper that I like and kind of start, go from there, but I don't think that's the best way of doing it. Yeah, I've done that too, actually gone through and like look through citations, but I always wonder if it's indirectly leading to bias because sometimes researchers build off each other and then maybe they get into a niche thing, and, but I wouldn't know all of the implications, you know, all the time, so. Mark, you want to comment on that? Any hints? Yeah, yeah, I can um, 
so this is a like this is a meaningful discussion, I think, because it gets to the heart of most of the searching you're probably doing. So the, what I was talking about is kind of a more formal approach that might be overkill for a lot of the searches you're going to have to do in a typical kind of context. Uh, there are resources that, um, uh, in case, so what you were describing, uh, it kind of not necessarily being you're going through an article, not necessarily seeing the uh, you know the application of it, or it's not necessarily relevant. Uh, that's that's a common problem because there's so much literature you can't really keep up with it at all. Uh, but there are summary resources, what we would call as uh, call summary resources, like up to date and Dynamed, which pool together the best uh, available evidence uh, um, to some degree. And so those are also good resources to start with. So rather than going to PubMed. Um, or if you go to PubMed, run a search, and you start seeing like way too many results, and you can't really make heads or tails of it, you can jump to one of these summary resources where they have kind of an editorial back, backing, essentially, where people have summarized the available evidence, and that can then provide you with context that can maybe make your uh, PubMed searches for clinical trials or whatever it is you're looking for more fruitful. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there are also um, uh, like filters within PubMed that might be beneficial. So if you run a typical search in PubMed, you just string together a couple terms and you get like a thousand results. Uh, I think a default filter is like uh, clinical trials or systematic reviews, and that might help you narrow um, uh, your, your, your results set down to like those higher level studies on the evidence pyramid, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with that thing. Um, so those are the two things that come to mind based on that discussion. You know, Thank you. Uh, one of the, that, <laughs> yes, that's a, that's a great approach. One of the things that I've been impressed by as a, a, a manuscript reviewer for journals um, is that many people are just citing the same articles and sometimes they are citing an article that somebody else cited. I have a colleague who tried to kind of map back where, an, where, a, where a statement first came from and it can be really hard to find. And so, um, you know, one of the things I try to do as a reviewer, although I'm, I have to say, I can't stand to go through all of them, is I try to look at some of the articles and see if they actually are supporting the statement that the authors make. Um, and so, one caution when you're doing that form is you want to look at those articles and 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 you will notice that sometimes they aren't really saying what the authors say they are, or it's kind of this general thing. So um, we have lots of issues in. Um, the citation of the literature that, you know, librarians could help us solve, but people are kind of lazy about what they cite. Um, and so that's why I, I think, especially if you're doing a systematic review, but if you're trying to get, as you say, sort of an unbiased look at things, um, I also start with people's, you know, like an article I like, and I start with their citations, uh, but I think you have to go beyond that to get the real answers. Librarians can be lazy too. So it's not a, unique to your field. Uh, I'll, I'll add one other kind of random comment to, to leverage one of the tools that, so Mark, you set up a thing where, so, so you could get weekly updates of, of a particular search you constructed, which is, which is really cool and really focused. But, but another option for that tool is, is you can set up a search where every week it sends you the table of contents from a selection of journals. So, so you can leverage the NIH database to just kind of keep you up to date on the general literature in the world of anesthesiology without subscribing, uh, which I find actually to be a relatively easy way just to, just to keep in touch with what folks are talking and writing about. You don't have to subscribe to the British Journal of Anesthesia, but you can see what the editorials were last week. And that's kind of entertaining in a nerdy way. And I'll plug Twitter for that as well. I mean, I, I think Twitter is a great medium for, um, it, you know, I, I think it's, it's a way for me to show that I'm getting older because it's my only form of social media. Um, but it's, it, it really is a, a great medium. I will say probably every third or fourth talk I'm giving uh, as I'm on the plane in route to the meeting and just tweaking my slides, I'll plug something new in, something that um, comes up and I see it mainly uh, through a tweet. And you really, not only do you get a feel of, of like what's being published, as Neil said, you also um, get to see the response in the community, which sometimes isn't what you'd expect. Um, 
There's the other benefits of it definitely helps with circulation, citation, reads. There's no doubt. I mean, this, this is actually evidence-based. Uh, the more you the more you tweet it and the better you put visuals into what you tweet, the more likely it is to go. Harry, I think we'll take one more question, and then I want to be conscious of time because we're coming up on the hour. Yeah, you know I just I just I just wanted to I just wanted to attach onto your Twitter comments because I also find most of my interesting articles on Twitter. I really appreciate people who tell me what's in the article when they tweet it. So yeah. if you're going to be tweeting articles, um, give some content so I don't have to go read it on my own before I decide if I want to read it. Yeah, I mean, the journals don't that I know of go after people who snap a couple of photos of fig key figures and put them into their tweets. Um, the other way that we do this, and I'll encourage you, um, I can send it around. There is one of our surgeons who, um, with annals of surgery years ago, started doing visual abstracts that have now become mainstream. And uh, I, there's no question they help with circulation. So he's got a really awesome uh, website for that. Um, Mark, I, I just can't thank you enough for, for taking time today. I, I know um, with COVID, the world is disconnected, so I haven't seen you in a long time. So i uh, really appreciative of your time and your, um, this will end up um, if, with your permission later on our website with, as an archived um, uh, lecture just for other students who come through because I think this is useful for years to come. So, and, and to uh, all the students and mentors, thank you so much. I, I know it's getting um, deep into summer. I know uh, Sandra and I were talking about how her her, her experience is coming to an end, which is really quite sad and it's fast, but um, I hope you're all doing well. And I hope you do get to also enjoy a little bit of your summer. I can't, can't say it enough. Make sure that you're getting out, enjoying some nice weather and, and taking some time, refreshing, be making sure you're ready for school as it comes forward, okay? Great. Thanks, Mark, really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks everyone. And Take care. Uh, Olivia, do we have another thing coming up? Well, I'm probably supposed to make an announcement. She probably told me. Yes, uh, we have our general club on July 28th um, coming up. That's our last session for the summer. So we'll have a, well, I don't know. We'll have a big wine and cheese party at our last session that you'll have to bring your own wine and cheese for. No. <laughs> so please come July 28th to that journal club because it's fun. And thank you all for attending. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.